kind of church God blesses. We've been looking at uh, Revelation and the, the letters to the seven churches, and tonight we're here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. It says, And to the church, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And coming quickly, hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these letters, and ask, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts tonight. Even though we're few, Lord, we still need to hear a word from you. So, Father, we pray that you break your word small. You would uh, speak to us directly, Lord, and individually. Lord, that we would, uh, we would grow and mature in our faith. Lord, that we would be strengthened, that we would be encouraged, Lord, and challenged to be the kind of people you want us to be. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Of our Lord's seven letters to these churches in Asia Minor, only two of these churches didn't receive any kind of correction or, abu or rebuke or, or negative statement. One was the letter to the church in Smyrna in Revelation 2, 8 through 11, and the other is this letter to the church in Philadelphia. While the letter to the church in Smyrna is, is a challenge for them to remain faithful unto death, this letter seems to be filled with compliments, with praise. Uh, the other five letters all contain words of complaint, words of correction, but this church receives nothing but praise from the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you read it, you become very quickly aware that this is a church that the Lord is using for His glory. In fact, down through history, the kind of churches God has used most often fit into this Philadelphia church mold. And I want our church, you know, we all want our church to be a church that God can use, right? Uh, I want the Lord to look down on us and say there, there is a church right there that I can do something with for my glory. Those folks are ready to be used by me. And I would like for us to fit into this Philadelphia church mold. And I believe that it would be worth our time this evening to look into this passage and examine for ourselves these characteristics of a church that God uses. And then let's see whether or not Temple Baptist Church fits the mold or not. And, and if it does, then praise the Lord, let's move forward. And, and, and if it doesn't, if we see some issues we need to deal with, then you know, let's not waste our time trying to change the mold. Let's change the church and fit the mold that God has set before us. So first consider the Christ of this church. His attributes to begin with. The attributes. Not moving. Mm -hmm. All right. This verse points out what the, what the captain of this kind of church is like. Let's let's just pick out two. Number one, he is holy. Uh, in other words, he's without limits. He's absolutely perfect. He's sinless. The Lord we serve is absolutely holy. Uh, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, verses 21 and 22, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. And, and it says in Hebrews 4, 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And as Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1.16,
because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Uh, in other words, those who wish to walk with Him must learn to walk in holiness just like God, just like Jesus Christ. The second attribute I want us to see here is that He's honest. The word true means genuine, that which is real. In other words, He's the only one worthy of faith, trust, and obedience. He's the one that we should follow. Uh, the church God uses will always be a church that makes much of the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about exalting the rod of God this morning. We are exalting Christ. We are exalting the message of the gospel of Christ. And that is, is what we're supposed to be about. The Apostle Paul puts it in this way in Colossians 1.18. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Jesus should be first place. He should be who we exalt. Uh, next, as we consider the Christ of this church, let's consider two things concerning his activity. Here's what the, the captain of this kind of church is doing. First, look at his work in the doors of life. Uh, he's busy opening and closing doors. When it says that Jesus has the key of David, it's a reference to Isaiah 22, verse 22, which says, Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. And, and, and that's a prophecy concerning a servant of David by the name of El Eliakim. But it was also a picture of the coming Messiah uh, who would die on the cross. Uh, the idea of keys conveys two thoughts, really. A key conveys access, and it conveys authority. The person who has the keys can let you in, right? I can let you into church. There's the church keys right there. You get in with those. Dave and Mary have some keys. Steve, I you know. Just about everybody in here has keys. One guy, you got your own keys, but we'll let you into church because we want you to be a part of us. Right? But, but, but authority and access. The person who has the keys can let you in. He has the keys, and with the keys uh, comes that authority and, and, and uh, to let people in or to keep people out at, at God's discretion. Uh, your car keys, your house keys, uh, our children, even though our children no longer live with us, they have keys to get in our house. They have the authority. They have the access. Certain family members have access to our home. But we, we certainly don't let strangers have keys to get in our house. Uh, Jesus is described here as the key man. Uh, he holds the keys of access and authority for all of life. And, and we might acknowledge two types of keys. First, he holds the keys of salvation. Look again at John's description in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. It says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. He alone can unlock heaven and lock hell, and he alone can lock heaven and unlock hell for you. You know, which will he do? The second kind of keys he holds are the keys of service. Verse 8 again, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Jesus alone unlocks the doors of ministry. It's he who decides what churches and ministries prosper and, and, and to what extent they prosper. And when he has opened a door of service, you, you can expect him to bless you greatly if you go through it. If you trust him by faith and walk through it. When, when he's closed the door of service, you might as well just you know, accept it and move on because that's, that's closed now. No amount of pleading or pushing or pounding will reopen that door. Next, consider his watchfulness in the deeds of love. His watchfulness in the deeds of life. The Lord is constantly watching the lives of His people. Uh, Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, 
watching the evil and the good. And Hebrews 4.13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He knows what we do with the opportunities he gives us. He, he watches our works. He sees our successes. He sees our failures. In other words, he is in the midst of his church to create opportunities for blessings and usefulness. He's in the midst of his church to judge our motives, to judge our ministries. And yet his own people often don't recognize the Creator in their midst. They often don't follow his direction and go through the open door he places before them. Do you, do you suppose that many churches would come to new life if they learned to recognize and worship and honor the Christ who moves among them? Okay, so first we've considered the church of Christ. Next, let's consider the condition of this church. Three, three thoughts here. First of all, the privilege they enjoyed. This, this was a church blessed by the Lord. He, he'd given them an open door for ministry. He promised to keep that door open for them in spite of all others, uh, all that other people might do to shut that door. The city of Philadelphia was founded as a missionary city, if you will. It was founded as a doorway to Asia so that the Greek culture could spread uh, to the peoples of the East, and, and they were therefore familiar with the idea of open doors. Uh, there are times today when the Lord will place open doors before a church, before a certain ministry. Uh, we've certainly seen that here at, at Temple. We can think of, of angel food. The door was open for a time, and then that door just slammed shut. Our free store ministry, the door is still wide open. The, the uh, 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 harvest festival party we have, it's, it was open before I got here, and it still remains open, and it's, it's a ministry God blesses and, and continues to use. And so the wise thing to do when we see that open door is step through it because when, when the Lord is determined to bless a church, nobody can stop that from happening except for the church who refuses to do what, what God's leading them to do. Sometimes, though, God will allow a church or a ministry to, to face those closed doors. And, and so what do you do then? Well, you wait before him patiently until he opens, uh, opens another, another door uh, or, or that door in another way. It's not an easy thing to do. Sometimes it's confusing. We feel like we're just feeling around in the dark. But what we need to realize is that all of God's doors, both the open ones and the closed ones, are a blessing. What do we do with the doors of life? Uh, what we do with them determines the course of our ministry. Secondly, concerning the condition of this church, consider the power they exhibited. Jesus says in verse 8, because you have a little power. Uh, that probably means they were a small church, limited resources, few workers. However, what they probably saw as weaknesses, our Lord saw as, as their greatest strengths. Uh, we're often guilty, I think, of the same comparisons. You know, far too often we're guilty of looking at what we can't do, how few we are, instead of what God has called us to do. I saw a, a video the other day about a guy saying, uh, you need to look at things that are impossible and just say to yourself, what if? What if I could do that? If I could do it, what would it look like? It's impossible. We all know that. We've already acknowledged that. It's impossible to do that. But what if I could do it? And what would it look like if I was doing it? I think, you know, saying, well, God's God. He can do anything He wants to. And so we need to not say, well, we can't do that because of this, because of that. We need to say, well, what if God wants us to do that? How would we do that? You know, what would, what would that look like? How do we step forward in that if that's what God wants? Uh, if, if we could ever learn to take God at His word, trust Him by faith, just go forward for His glory, regardless of what we think, what we see, what we feel, uh, we would experience God's work, I think, in new and deep and in profound ways. Remember what God told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9? And He has said to me, My grace is what? Sufficient for you for what? Power is perfected in weakness. That almost sounds wrong, doesn't it? But that's what he says. Power is perfected in, in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. It's about throwing that, that stick down again 
Letting God take the evil out of it. Remember what Paul told the Romans in, in Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, what? Who could be against us? Who's against us? <laughs> Nobody else stands a chance. Even Satan himself doesn't stand a chance. Concerning the condition of this church, we've considered the privilege they enjoyed and the power they exib exhibited. Now, consider the proof they embody. The, the latter part of verse 8 tells us why the Lord blessed this church and used them like He did. They had their priorities right. They gave proof positive that they were His and that they were committed to serving Him. First, they possessed the right standard of faith. It was a church that was walking in obedience to the Word of God. The, the Bible was their standard of faith, and, and they refused to, to deviate, to, to turn aside from that. The Lord will bless a church like that that's faithful to the Word of God. Why? Well, obedience to the Word of God is proof of our love for God. John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will do what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Because we love Him, we hold His Word in high regard. We're, we're lifting high the, the staff of God. And, and that honors Him, and He in turn honors that. And, and in His time, the Lord will open all the right doors for the church that has the right standard of faith. And also, they possess the right statement of faith. They, they hadn't denied His name. In other words, they were a people who were all about Jesus. He was the centerpiece of their worship and their praise. He was why they gathered. He was the, the most important thing. His statement uh, carries the idea that this church wasn't ashamed of Christ's death on the cross. They were not ashamed to preach salvation by faith through grace. They, they wanted the world to know about their glorious Lord because they made much of Jesus. He made much of them. And this is the kind of church that we need to strive to be. Amen? And next, let's consider thirdly the challenges of this church. This church certainly wasn't without its challenges. I don't think there's a church that's ever been in existence that didn't have challenges. And while Jesus... He, he here commends them for their standards. He also challenges them to continue to go forward for His glory. Three challenges. First, the challenge of persecution. Not everybody was happy with these folks. In fact, they had some very powerful enemies from some who claimed to know Jesus but actually were unsaved, were lost people. The, the true church will always be the target of those who don't really know the Lord. In, in a way, when, when folks who, who, are, who aren't walking with Jesus Christ start to criticize the church, we ought to praise the Lord because He is proof that we are His. The challenge is, is to remain faithful in spite of whatever anybody says about you. Keep serving, keep living, keep preaching, keep worshiping. When, when the dust settles at the end of the trail, everybody's going to know where everyone else was standing in relationship to Jesus Christ. Second is the challenge of, of perseverance. Uh, here the church receives this glorious promise that they'll be removed from the world before some great disaster. And I personally believe that that may be a reference uh, to the rapture of the church. Uh, there's a challenge for these folks to carry on for the Lord, knowing that one day He's returning. He's going to take His church out of the world. Obviously, the Lord didn't return in their, their lifetimes, but that doesn't change the fact that He is coming back. Our duty to Him is to live every day like He'll return right now. You know, next second. And, and to work every day like He, he may never come back. You just keep planning to, to keep serving Him and doing what, what we're to do for Him. We're, we're to stand for Him until He comes, whether we go through the grave or or go through the clouds, we're, we're called to persevere. Those who genuinely belong to Him will persevere. Those who don't are going to fall by the wayside along the way. The third challenge is the challenge of protection. The Lord cautions them regarding them, their future rewards. They're, they're to keep their guard up so that they're not pulled from, from the right path and, and as a result lose their rewards. He's not talking about salvation, I don't think, in this case. He's talking about rewards in heaven. You can't lose your salvation, but you can go to heaven smelling as if you were purchased at a fire sale. Don't let the devil crowd or, 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 or let the worldly...
church crowd cause you to get your eyes off the prize to be one at the end of the race. Keep serving God every day. Run with your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, as Hebrews tells us. Okay, we've considered the, the church of this, this uh, the Christ of this church, the conditions of this church, the challenges of this church, and finally, tonight, let's consider the comfort of this church. The, the, the Lord closes this passage here in verses 12 and 13 with a very wonderful word of promise to these people in Philadelphia. And the first is the comfort of his, his stability. The promise that they'll stand as pillars in the temple of God in heaven. Uh, history records that influential citizens of Philadelphia would, offer, would often be honored by the city uh, leaders with a pillar placed in their name in one of the pagan temples. That was a, the way they, they showed respect and honor to certain citizens. And, and that's why we think that there's this reference here. It, it, it isn't very likely that any members of the Philadelphian church were ever recognized as outstanding citizens in this pagan city, although they might have been. However, the Lord tells them for sure here that He's watching and He's going to set up, uh, set them in His Father's temple in glory as, as pillars. Uh, and it's interesting to notice that all, all the pagan temples that stood in Philadelphia, uh, with, with all the thousands of pillars, exactly none of those pillars are still standing today. Uh, you see, the honor of, of men is fleeting, but the honor of the Lord promises these people uh, in heaven, their honor will be eternal. What, what would you rather have? Temporary recognition here or eternal stability up there in heaven? Next, we see the comfort of his safety. They're promised that they will not go out from it anymore. This is, is perhaps a reference to the fact that Philadelphia was, was built near an active volcano. When the mountain began to rumble, the citizens of the city would force to go out of it, <laughs> to leave it quickly and flee. Uh, in, in many ways, it was a very unsafe place to live. And, and Jesus reminds them here uh, that they're headed to a place of safety in heaven. Uh, the world can be changing and there may be many dangers on every hand, but those who have the door of heaven open to them find a place of, of eternal safety, peace, rest, security. You don't have to worry about the tornado. You don't have to worry about a hurricane or a flood or anything or even a, an ice storm. You're safe. Lastly, he gives them the comfort of his security. They, they receive the wonderful promise that they'll be identified as the people of God forever. They'll have his name written upon them. They'll be identified as citizens of heaven. Uh, they'll even have the precious promise that they'll bear the name of the Savior. And, and what he's talking about here is their security. Those who trust the Lord are claimed by Him. You know, you, you own something, you write your name on it, right? Well, He's going to write His name on us and, and show that we belong to Him. Hebrews 2.11 says, both For both He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And then in Hebrews eleven sixteen it says, But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They've guaranteed uh, their citizenship in his heaven, as Paul reminds us in Philippians three twenty. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They possess the comfort of his security as they pass through this world. And this is the kind of church God uses. Once more here in verse 8, the Philadelphian church demonstrates the attributes of dependability, dedication, devotion, and as a result, the Lord blessed them and he used them in that day for his glory. He's using them today as an example to us. Uh, we, we need to join together in asking the Lord to help us be a church like Philadelphia, a church that God can use even in spite of, of the, tra you know, the tragedies around us, in spite of the dangers around us. Uh, we, we need to ask Him to, to allow us to join in being a church like that. Let's pray that Temple might become that church this evening. And, and I, I wanted to use this greatly 
uh, and he will if we submit to his conditions. I want us to ask that question, what if God could fill this, this house with people again? How would that look? How would he do that? God can do that. Is that what he wants? We need to work on our walk with God as individuals and as a church. Let's bow together in prayer. Let's each one of us seek the Lord and ask Him, Lord, what's the part you want me to play? Lord, how, how would I need to change? What would I need to do to, in order to be more like a member of the Philadelphia church? Let's just quietly bow in prayer right now. Father God, we ask that you would open our eyes to the truth of this world. Lord, we saw in this video that preceded our message tonight, Lord, of people dealing with witchcraft. And Lord, we know that there are evil people all around us, even in this city. Lord, we know the occult is strong and powerful, Lord. We admit it. But Father, we know that you are even greater. You are more powerful. Lord, that you created everything in this world. Lord, help us to be submissive to you. Help us, Lord God, to seek to be a church like Philadelphia. Help us to be members of a church like that. Lord, to examine our individual lives. Lord God, to see where we're, we're falling short. Lord, where our faith is weak. Lord God, we, we praise you that, that we can glory in our weaknesses because, Lord God, we, we realize as we studied this morning, we need to lay down all the things that we lean on, all the things that we rely on, Lord God, that we need to consider them as useless in our hands, Lord God, and, and let you remove the evil that all those things we, we trust in, those things we rely on, Lord God, to, to be cleansed. And then, Lord God, help us to, to lift up your word, to lift Lift up the, the message of God, the staff of God, and, and to hold it boldly, Lord, to hold it in faith before the, the, the world, Lord, and to see your victory won, both in our church and in our individual lives. Lord God, strengthen us for the task. Too. Lord, help our unbelief, help our, our weak faith. Help us, Lord, to trust in you, to believe in you, to step out mightily in your name. Father, we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.